Welcome to another edition in this series of talks organized on behalf of SPIDERS, the sole platform for initiating discourses on equitable and resilient society. The talks complement a series of original papers published on the SPIDERS platform dedicated to outlining the building blocks of post-capitalist political economies and societies not oriented around growth and profit, but rather good lives and a flourishing web of life in times of profound planetary change. Hosting these talks, our founder of the Peer-to-Peer -Peer Foundation, Michel Balance, and myself, Rok Krantz. Today, to help, help us outline some of these building blocks, we're joined by distinguished guest, Dr. Jose Ramos, our author of the paper, The Power of Ideas, Cosmolocalism and the Transformation of the Production of Everyday Life. Welcome, Jose. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, great to see you, Jose. Thank you, Michelle. So as a bit of a disclaimer, uh, Jose um, has you know, worked in the past with uh, both myself and Michelle on a number of topics, uh, one of these being cosmolocalism, but also very much so in the fields of foresight and futures. So to start off this discussion, uh, as with all guests, uh, we thought to, uh, you know, have a bit of, you know, uh, get from the horse's mouth, uh, how you got into this field, specifically cosmolocalism, uh, your influences, inspirations, um, how you got here. Yeah, well, that really um, goes back to 1998 and 99. So I was living in Taiwan. Taiwan really began to conscientize me around the issues around globalization. I was teaching English. A lot of my students were talking about the problems that Taiwan had. Uh, they were uh, one of those um, newly industrialized countries, NICS, and um, they had horrendous problems with their environment. Um, they had their, their, their uh, rife with pollution, um, you know, computer companies, industrial development at a massive scale, very fast, but um, no real capacity to, uh, to deal with the externalities of those industries. So for example, uh, Taiwan had the highest concentration of lead in its rice in the world. Um, and a lot of the people that I met were victims of cancer. Uh, or had uh, wives or husbands who had died because of cancer. Uh, and so I really got to see how a, a small nation like Taiwan was applied uh, into a global system that was um, both, uh, you know, kind of uh, driving a particular labor regime and at the same time had uh, terrible environmental impacts. And around that same time, uh, I, I, from Taiwan, I was keeping track of the battle in Seattle, the, the, the protests against the WTO in Seattle. And, um, and to see what happened there and to see, uh, Mary Calder called it the meeting of Teamsters and Turtles. So it was um, the unions and the environmental movement basically coming together and saying, this is not working. Our, our, our globalized economic system is having massive negative impacts in the world. It's stripping away our autonomy, our democratic rights. Uh, we need to come together and do something. So it was one of those early examples within the, within the development of, you know, kind of a global civic sphere where people began to work across what I would call um, ontologies. There are different uh, different, different types of organizations, different perspectives from different um, embodied localities, you know, uh, unions, environmental organizations, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it, you know, became very, very like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very pointy issue. And to be, you know, there was 20 years of protests against uh, neoliberalism, but in the West that only happened right at sort of the end of the 90s. But if you go back to Latin America, Africa, that was already happening throughout the 80s and the 90s. And by the time you got to 1999, 
the International Forum on Globalization had already been formed and they were preaching uh, relocalization. People like Edward Goldsmith, um, uh, Elena Norbert Hodge, Vandana Shiva, um, a whole number of other people were talking this language of, okay, we've, we've gone too far and we need to re-empower the local. So, um, so in that context, there was this question of what do you do and how do you think? And by that time I was already thinking about futures and thinking, of, okay, what does it mean to actually think about the future in a way that's going to address our real challenges? And, and that's when the World Social Forum was invented. Uh, it happened in Porto Alegre in 2001. Their motto was, another world is possible. It was a utopian call, basically, in the context of this um, global system, economic system that was having uh, massively damaging effects, um, undermining labor rights, casualizing work, um, hurting people, especially at the bottom, and also the commodification of nature at a vast scale. So, uh, so to have the World Social Forum come forth and say another world is possible uh, was, was really a transformational moment. And from 2001 to 2003, I was doing a degree in future studies and I was basically watching from the sideline, uh, but you know, basically studying futures. And I was always really, really uh, dissatisfied in futures because futures was so speculative. Uh, and I just felt like, what do we do? What do we do in the present? And it felt like the World Social Forum was, 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 being, was using the utopian imagination, but also saying, we're gonna meet now and we're going to formulate alternatives. So I was inspired by that. And then in 2004, I decided without any, you know, real like, uh, I didn't have any research program. I didn't have, I just decided to go to the, the World Social Forum in Mumbai. And, uh, and I got to, I really got to meet the people that were at the heart of the movement. You know, I got to meet Edward, Edward Goldsmith and Arundhati Roy. I'm gonna meet him personally, but you know, I got to, I got to hear them talk and I got to have some conversations. I got to meet uh, Eloisa Rodriguez who was doing social money in, in Buenos Aires, you know, after the uh, financial collapse there. I mean, I've met untouchables who walked for um, 200 miles to get to the World Social Forum in Mumbai and who are talking about how globalization impacts untouchability, you know, uh, um, or the Dalit, right? So, um, so it was it was a truly uh, conscientizing uh, event, and from there um, I got to, you know you sort of get that density and that complexity you get from meeting lots of people and understanding lots of issues, and and then from there I basically uh, decided to start a social forum in Melbourne. I had met a few people there. I'd met Carl Fitzgerald, um, and I met a few other people. Judy McVeigh and um, and a few others, and we said, okay, well, let's do a local social forum. And by that time, we already realized that there were local social forums. There are actually hundreds of social forums that were happening around the world. So we were not just part of these global events. We were part of these local events where we were convening people that were looking at alternatives to the existing uh, global economic system um, and neoliberal neoliberal. Uh, capitalism and, and beginning to think about alternatives. And that was in our early days. Um, and then I met Michelle, I think in 2005. So that was around that time, actually, just around that time, I met you, Michelle. And, uh, and then the way that, you know, you talked about um, the inversion. So, you know, the immaterial is made expensive, the material is made cheap. So you've got a problem because materiality is not being true costed, right? And you also have a problem because immateriality is me being made artificially scarce. And so again, that was another aspect of that layer of, of okay, this is how capitalism is working at this point in time. Um, and so my, you know, my, my, I, I jumped into a PhD thesis and just decided to continue down this track of trying to understand, um, well, you know, if neoliberalism isn't working, what are the alternatives? 
And so that took me on a journey to essentially map what are the different theories, what are the different social movements, what are different people that are advocating for change, and what are they saying, right? And so, so that mapping process was really fundamental. That was almost like pulling apart the, uh, you know, if you have something, an organism, you know, it was like dissecting it. You know, you've got, you've got this part and that part, you got a hand, you got a stomach, and you got this and that. Truly really trying to understand it. And it was an action research project. So it was really from the inside. And I was uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, an activist uh, developing educational curriculum. I was doing uh, documentary videos and I was um, uh, establishing, you know, organizing protests and, and, and events, right? So I was doing all kinds of activity as part of the, you know, what you might call the global justice movement or part of the World Social Forum. And, uh, and so from that viewpoint, I began to kind of develop these, these understanding of what are the different elements in, uh, in what are people saying, you know? And, and, and I, I basically broke it into a number of different schools. Um, there are nine schools and they included um, the peer-to-peer -peer and the network perspective. They included um, neo-Marxism, the work of William Robinson and Leslie Scalaire. They included um, engendered perspectives, feminist perspectives like Ariel Saleh and her ideas around the meta-industrial class. Uh, they included um, ideas around relocalization, what the International Forum on Globalization were talking about. They included uh, uh, cosmopolitanism, uh, the ideas of David Held and Mary Caldor and John Keane and others who, you know, are kind of uh, drivers of the cosmopolitan discourse. And also it included the evolutionary discourse on humanity, you know, kind of what you see in the film by Stanley Kubrick, 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know, where the, where the proto-human, the ape is, you know, bashing the head of another, uh, you know, um, early man, early human. And, uh, and, and he's sort of providing this almost like an evolutionary timeline, that perspective that human beings are a species um, and how do we understand ourselves as a species? So there were a number of these different discourses that I began to kind of identify as part of uh, the alternative globalization movement. Um, I also drew a lot on the work of uh, Bob and Tuda de Souza Santos and, um, and his idea of epistemologies of the global South. And so from there, um, I think it sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily, I didn't have the idea of cosmolocalism when I finished my PhD in 2010, but somehow it kind of got seeded um, by the work of Michelle, by the different, um, by the different uh, um, discourses that I, that I gathered in the PhD. And I, I think that was that space of the in-between. And what I, the other thing I noticed is that the really interesting ideas were coming from the syncretic. They're coming from people who are combining ideas. And, and so I had this kind of new appreciation for, for example, the work of, um, is it Michael Hart, who wrote Multitude, you know, and Negri, right? They were, being, they were being transgressive in the way that they looked at how different elements combined. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, that was that space. And, and I just began to explore those ideas. Um, in Singapore, I remember, you know, uh, Michelle, you know, you visited in Singapore and that was really great. Um, when we got to hang out together in 2012. Um, and I, I remember I gave a talk um, on, um, on uh, at, at the school I was teaching at, the National University of Singapore at the LKY school. And uh, I decided to call it co uh, cosmopolitan, was, so talk on cosmopolitan localism. Uh, and so I began to explore this kind of conjunction between um, this cosmopolitan discourse and the localization discourse and a few other things. So, at that point, it's just very exploratory. I just didn't totally understand what, what I was trying to say, but I knew that there were different elements. Um, and I think the, the, the critiques of the sharing economy, I remember we had a really good discussion, Michelle, in Singapore, where you, know, you really just laid it out. Like, this is how the sharing economy is being co-opted. 
this is how it's being, you know, basically destroyed. Um, and so I, I began to kind of almost take, you know, obviously a critical post-capitalist lens around, you know, what do we actually do? So, um, yeah, so I mean, from that, you know, um, began working with Michelle, we began exploring different ideas, um, different papers, and, um, and, I, and then I started a makerspace in, um, in Footscray in Melbourne with a, with, a, with a bunch of colleagues. And then the words cosmolocalization just kept on coming out of my mouth, just kept on coming out. Um, because I was in a space and, 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 and everyone understood it. That was the interesting thing. It was a lot of syllables, but when I explained, look, you have this global design commons, we should just be manufacturing that wh whatever we need here. Everyone got it. I mean, making that happen was just impossibly hard, right? So actually doing that in a makerspace in 2013, 2014 was unbelievably difficult to do. But, um, but, um, but everyone understood that that was the future. It was so clear, so implicit, and especially with the values in a, in a makerspace. You know, people care about recycling. People care about reusing and upcycling. And people care about uh, knowledge commons. And so the ethos in most makerspaces, I would say, are, is, is really amazing. And so just being in that, in that community, I think was very powerful at that time, even though we never really got to a cosmolocal model in that makerspace, in the Footscray Maker Lab. Still, it was very formative, yeah. If I can make a little uh, kind of a shortcut. So basically, I think that, you know, what your experience was with these movements, like the social forum, that was already cosmolocal, right? But they were peer producing political knowledge and understanding together. And at the same time, you had the open source movement already, since about the same time, the mid 90s, that were producing immaterial things together, like software designs, knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and then with the makerspace, you will reach a third phase where people are actually making physical things, right? So you, there's like there's a maturation process that you went through. Yeah. Which you know yeah. parallels the 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 way the world uh, also evolved at the same time. Um, I like and, that. And yeah, yeah, I can see that. I mean, we we wanted to make physical things out of the digital. That was a desire, and we knew that the, at the time the Thingverse was there, before it got you know kind of you know kind of commodified. Um, but it was there. The possibilities were all there. Yeah. It was kind of like yeah. it was. You could feel it. You could feel the the possibility. Yeah. Great. So, so yeah. So maybe you, because we we took quite a bit of time in you know preparing the context. Right. But so, yeah. how how would you define very precisely what cosmo local production is, and what it is not? I can give you an example, um, which kind of disturbs me actually. So there's this new company called Arrival, and they are very well funded. They have uh, a factory in Berlin and, and one in uh, somewhere around London. They had 1,000 software engineers in employ. They brought down 570 robots that are now used in mass manufacturing of cars to 70. And around basically kind of a, like, a, you know, a space in the middle where the, the car, the van or the bus is made uh, at the moment of the, you know, the order, but it's entirely proprietary. And so the, at, at one point, what we predicted is there. So there's now a well-funded company that is completely organized around these cosmolocal principles, except it's not cooperative and it doesn't share uh, its IP. So I think mm. we, we should lay out for the public that, you know, what we mean precisely when we say cosmolocal production and also what it is not, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and I think that that's the, that's the discursive move of what cosmolocalism intends to do. So we want to create a distinction between a capitalist mode of production, um, which 
which is typified by uh, accumulating value for shareholders and creating externalities for other people with a stake from what cosmolocalism is, which is producing um, based on the legacy of human knowledge and, and the legacy of open knowledge. So the, the vision is that if we have a global sphere of knowledge, of designs, of ideas, um, that potentiates solution creating, solution making, livelihoods, responses to climate change, carbon, uh, carbon reduction. Uh, we can solve many problems with all of the knowledge that humanity has, if it's open, if it's open. Yeah. And for, for it to be open is a, um, is, a, is a strong political movement, right? It's not simply a, it's not a naive decision one can make. It's actually a, uh, an ethical and contextual choice um, given the crises that we're facing today. Yeah. Well, I, I would argue that we're in the middle of one of these crises because with the vaccines around COVID-19, you have a situation where, you know, like most of the research was carried out by universities with public funding. It's then giving, it's been given as a proprietary uh, IP uh, to um, pharmaceuticals who then produce it with a turpus and surplus and refuse to share it. So then that we're now in a situation where only the Western countries, I think like Canada, bought for 11 times what it needs for its own population. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still not sharing. And so people in Africa and, every, and everywhere else have simply no access to, you know, to, just to give a contemporary example of what non-cosmo-local non production creates in terms of crisis, um, because it, it is not able to share uh, vital medicines that should be should be available to everyone. Look, these kind of monopolies exist everywhere. Um, when when I was doing um, that course in Mumbai on cosmolocal design, um, you know, I basically gave the model for cosmolocalism and said, look, here's the global design commons. We can we can do the production at a local scale. Let's look at the different challenges that we're facing that you want to grapple with, and let's get into that. And there was one group and they were saying, well, the model doesn't work. And I said, why? And they said, well, it's because <clears throat> the mafia, because this was around um, water, because you know, places like Bangalore and many other cities in India have, have water shortages, but a lot of them are artificial water shortages. I asked him, what's the problem? He said, well, the, um, the, the Indian government will never support a, a Cosmo local model for water abundance because they're controlled by the, um, it's too corrupt. They're controlled by the, the interests, the political interests and, the, and there's water mafias and the water mafias control the policy. And, uh, and so I said, well, what, 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 what could you do instead? How would you start it? And they said, well, we, we could be successful if we started with a cooperative. And the cooperative builds membership and the members create their own pools of open knowledge so that they can solve their water problems. And then, and then you have local solidarity in response to um, uh, the water mafias. And so basically what they were saying was, um, yeah, you can do that, but you have to start from the local. And so I think part of the, the challenge and the dilemma is that Sometimes you can go global down, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to go local up. Um, and that's really where the local and the cos cosmos kind of really need to come together. This is about grassroots mutualization, but also about planetary mutualization of knowledge. I, yeah. if, I, if I may interject, because you know it's also the subject yeah. that's dear to my heart, and I, I yeah, know you yeah. know this and it's, yeah. it's in no, your own no, essay. No, no, no. Yeah. But so the, the issue I think, in, and you mentioned the pre-production license, right? So the, the issue that I see is that when people start working together in open source and open source is for everybody, 
So yeah. then you immediately have a situation where powerful well finance groups can use that share knowledge and they have yeah. the investment to do something with it and to do so much more with it than other people who don't have that, that capital. And so that's where we introduced the idea that you talk about in your essay about protecting like a semi-protection level where you say, okay, mm -hmm. this is our knowledge. The knowledge can be shared, but if you want to commercialize it, um, you know, then, then you have to be reciprocal with our project. And I think that's what your Indian friends are groping for. And that still not so many people understand. And I think it's, it's crucial because what happens is that the surplus gets diffused. And so yeah. the power, the power and the capital and everything leaks to the capital system. And there's, there's only one way in my view to, to avoid that, which is to, you know, to create a cooperative structure that goes with the open source. And so I would add that as a criterion for cosmolocal production. So it's not just about open yeah. knowledge and local production, but it's also about how the local production is organized and how the open knowledge is organized. And there you can add, yeah. you know, cooperative infrastructures, both at the bottom and at the top. I uh, totally agree. I couldn't agree more, Michelle. Um, and in the paper, I call that the value bleed dilemma. And, you know, I, I learned about that from you. Um, and also, I really love the peer to peer model with the three different modes. You know, you have the producer community, you have the, um, the governance and the protection of the commons, and you have the entrepreneurial coalition. Um, and it makes a whole lot of sense. You have to think, you know, this, in some respects, it, it does mimic some of the digital common space where you do need uh, like a Wikimedia foundation or, you know, Lawrence Lessig's uh, Creative Commons, um, you know, I don't know what, 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 what entity that is, but, you know, they all have yeah. a way of holding the institutional governance aspect of that and protecting that. Yeah. And so the way that I like, you know, in the paper basically discuss doesn't necessarily have the answers to those things, but it discusses a couple of different approaches to how we might think about it. Um, one of them is, is the license. So how do we have a license where if you're commercial, you pay back. If you're part of the commons or you're a cooperative, you pay less or you pay little or you pay none. You know, so, so a license that allows that to happen. I think that's, I mean, we've been talking about it for many years, that's a problem, you know, and we've yet to really see something like that work. So I'm, I'm getting I'm a little frustrated <laughs> to be honest. There's, um, there's a few small projects in France, for example, that, you know, but they're, they're not exploding or scaling very rapidly. So it's still yeah. at the experimental stage. Yeah. What I see in, a, in this, the, the section that I kind of added on this was around generating cosmolocal ecosystems. So um, in, in, in all the different examples in the cosmolocal reader that we've been working on, there are probably about seven of those examples are actually ecosystem generated. So one is the Fab City Global Initiative, Wikifactory, Beehive, Multifactory, Open Food Network, Holochain, Solar Urgia, and they're all different examples of how you generate an ecosystem. Um, so for example, Solar Urgia is, I call it like an anchor institution model. They don't necessarily, they don't talk about that at all. That's more of like a, like a, a Western or a US discourse around how you, you know, kind of cooperatize uh, an ecosystem. But because they were kind of backed by the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, and government money. And they, they, they created a co-op that was run by indigenous people to create the, uh, the um, solar panels. And they had a whole number of repair, repair systems for the solar lamps. They actually generated this very dynamic ecosystem where they could circulate value back. And so, so I, think that's, I, think, I think we have to look at the ecosystem level um, in terms of how we instantiate cosmolocal production. And we have to study these examples to see what's working. Solar Urja is a phenomenal success. Um, yeah. Open Food Network is a phenomenal success. 
um, you know, Wik, Wik, Wikifactory is really working, although it's owned, it's got, you know, um, owners behind it, still very successful. So we have to look at these ecosystem generating initiatives and yeah. try to understand um, how are they creating that ecosystem and how they, how, how's value being recirculated to deal with that value bleed that you've been discussing yeah. for, well, that, you know, as long as I've known you. So. so what I find very interesting in what you say, and this is very heartening for me, because what you're saying is that it's already scaling, at least in these seven cases, you know, we are already in an ecosystem and that's kind of a bottom up ecosystem. So I, I want to suggest something that is a bit more controversial and I'd be very happy to see what you think about it. I've been looking this year a lot at the blockchain ecosystems. And you know, I know there's a lot of critique you can make about the energy uh, cost of producing a number of these currencies, um, a kind of strong libertarian ethos in some of these projects, which is you know a kind of a hyper-capitalist ethos almost. But at the same time, they are based on open source. They are ecosystem oriented, so they actually designed not to be dominated by any single entity. So they allow, you know, coming in and out of the ecosystem. Um, and there's a very strong community dynamic. But at the same time, they're very successful now in accumulating value, right? They got like a total value of $1 trillion. Um, and so I'm and also positive about this uh, experience is that a lot of these projects reserve 40% of the income from the tokens for the, for the labor which I think is unprecedented, uh, you know, in terms of the, the capture of the value by the labor side. And it's all about infrastructures right now, right? And what I'm, what I'm thinking of is we should be able to merge, to find some kind of convergence between something that seems to work very well, you know, at the level of electronic infrastructures, dealing with financial systems and, and value capture and then what you're talking about, I, I, you know, I have no idea yet how this would happen, but I think this is something we have to look, we have to learn from the successes, you know, also, and then we can critique and filter it from a common point of view, but actually learn from, from some of these things and, and see how they can be applied in what you, you are finding with these seven ecosystems. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of. Yeah, something no, I mean, uh, intrigued like with. I think it's been implicit for a while now. You know, we see the maturation of the digital space and the, and the crypto space. And we know that we can create um, value exchange systems within that that have incentives and reward mechanisms and rules that can support um, commenting activities. And, and so it's, it's about the, uh, absolutely. Now I would, I would agree with you um, I, I think something is going to, there's a kind of, there's kind of the space of, of currencies or local currencies. There's a space of, you know, kind of transnational solidarity um, and, and this kind of cosmolocal co-creative space and the, you know, global design commons, so to speak. And between yeah. that, right. Uh, the, and, yeah. and local use, I can see something emerging and, and, and having real value, yeah. Yeah, well, in, in France, what they're doing is, and, and I'm very excited about this, um, it's actually somebody from the P2P Foundation. Um, so they're, de they're designing a policy at the territorial level, you know, the regions to make maker spaces the heart of a community oriented development. So they use a maker space to revitalize the knowledge that is, you know, craftspeople, some of them are dying, getting very old. So saving those knowledges, uh, you know, by formalizing them, uh, the knowledge about them, so that, you know, vi videotaping how they're doing these things uh, so that they, so the younger generations can learn uh, from it. And then taking people from the poor neighborhoods and, you know, upgrading their knowledge into the new digital sphere. Um, and so I think this combination of you know, very local development, community oriented, and then tapping in these global knowledge streams, I think that could be potentially a very powerful public policy because that's what we're talking about here.
mm. you know it's, it's yeah. using public policy to um you know kind of jumpstart this um this development yeah oh, yeah i think that's that's it's time's right for that i i agree yeah, yeah. So I was going to ask you: Have you seen anything like in your in your work, like for example, where you are in Australia or anywhere else, where you see at least some sign that, you know, public administrations or cities or regions are kind of starting to understand what this is about? Oh, good question. I'm not sure if I have a, a satisfying answer. Um, I mean, like I've been pretty much nose to the grindstone, just trying to get these cases together right. for the Cosmo Local Reader. And now I have about 38 or so. Um, I think that successes like, um, well, there's a couple, I mean, I mean, you know about the uh, Fab City Global Initiative, you know, so, so that's an ecosystem generating initiative. It's meant to influence policy I don't know to what extent it's had an impact in various cities and if how many cities have adopted it. I know it has chapters, but having a chapter is different than a city actually adopting it. Yeah. I know in Mexico City, for example, um, the guy who is behind Fab City, Mexico City, which is uh, I think Oscar Vasquez, uh, he, he, he's, you know, like he, he's worked with the, with the city government and uh, Mexico City is very creative, very progressive uh, municipality. So, you know, you can see kind of the relationships and the connections. Um, I mean, I, Melbourne as well, like it's very, uh, it's a very progressive council and they see the value of those things, but does that translate into actually um, adopting it as as policy? So, yeah, um, they think makerspaces are cool, and it's good for uh, the image of a municipality. Um, it's a little bit like having artists in your city. It makes it more desirable, and unfortunately, more kind of uh, ripe for gentrification. Right. So, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I have a really satisfying answer, Michelle, around that. I think, I think, I think our big challenge is to marry the. Our big challenge is to marry the, the examples that we found, with, policy change. And one of the things I tried to do in this paper, is to present the examples from the the Cosmo Local Reader, so they're all listed there. Right. And yeah. I didn't want to mediate it. I wanted people just to have them and to go, oh, okay, this is what you're talking about. Okay, let's look at Ability Made. Let's look at Beehive. Let's look at Armbot. Let's look at, you know, Field Ready. What are they doing? And, and so it's, um, I guess it's kind of a, it's, in the paper, there's a there's kind of this conversation between the empirical, which is what you've been doing for many many years with the, you know, with the uh, um, the wiki. You've been documenting. You you know, you're a librarian, and and on the other hand, kind of the 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 narrative, right? So there's in the paper there's a dialogue between the narrative and the the examples and the empirical. And I know that people are not going to buy the narrative if they don't have the examples. But if you just give people the examples, then what you're left with is people falling into the used future, the neoliberal discourse. So they go, they just see, you know, so you have to kind of have the narrative and, and the empirical at the same time. But what's missing is the policy that's right in the middle between those two. Right. And, 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 and I would say that's probably the weakness of the paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, the, you know, the recommendations come from an analysis of those papers, uh, I mean, of those examples. And, you know, I basically talk about, uh, about, you know, five things that we have to begin to deal with. So, uh, going beyond artificial scarcity, beyond new enclosures, you know, so how, how do we, how do we create protection around this is what we discussed before. 
dealing with the value bleed problem, generating ecosystems. Um, I also talk about models needed for making cosmolocal initiatives easier to establish. So right now it's just these examples, but it's like, if you were to start, jump into this, it would be very difficult to begin to think about how you do this. And I think probably from what exists, we can say, okay, there's probably about 10 different ways of doing it. There's 10 models that we can kind of extract. Let's make that easier to do for people. Yeah, that Let's would be very, that would be great. Break it down. So you've done, yeah, have you done that? So have you, have you some yeah, kind yeah. of- Yeah, I kind of, yeah. well, I didn't, I didn't pull apart all the models, but what I showed was that there are a number of models, like OpenDesk is a two-sided platform, right? But it's venture capital. Back. So why can't we do an open desk for different things? That's a platform co-op. Yeah. Right. Completely reasonable suggestion. Make a platform co-op. That's a two-sided platform. You don't have to compete with open desk. They do furniture, do it for something else. Do it for anything. Right. I think two-sided platforms are really ripe. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there's also uh, open motors. There are modular production for delivery to context. Okay, well, let's look at that model, right? How would we do that with different things? So I think there's, and there's contributory accounting. There's another, another approach to dealing with value. So I think there's a number of different um, models that we can extract from, from what exists and we can begin to uh, communicate them better and make it easier for people to go, oh, I want to do that. And I want to do that with, um, let's say, uh, what's something that we need all the time? You know, I want to do that with, um, with, with, with fabric, with what I, what I wear. Okay, how might we do that? How might we Cosmo localize um, fabric, right? Or how might we um, Cosmo localize um, uh, machinery for gardening, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a whole number of different things that can be extracted from that, that is just gonna make it easier. Um, and then I, I, I also talk, you know, this is kind of using some of your language again, partner state, you know? So how do we think about a partner state? Um, and, and then that really leads to the question of new political contract. Um, you know, the partner state is a new political contract between citizens and, and, and a state. It, it makes them partners. It makes them, it makes, it empowers citizens as co-creators of the commons, as managers and protectors of the commons. So, you know, how do we weave that in? So, yeah, so I think, you know, I'm sorry I don't have a satisfactory answer to that. And, you know, that's just one of these areas that we really have to work on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, very interesting. and. If I, if I can share just um, two, two, three minutes here. So I'm also looking into, because you know when you say partnership between the people and the nation and the state, uh, you're basically up against an ideology you know, that sees the state as the will of the people, right? It's the sovereign. Um, and so kind of, uh, it doesn't fit into the story. You know what I mean? Like if you're a politician, you've been elected to represent the people. So you speak in the name of the people. So what, what you know, what do the people have to add on to it? You, you know, you're already being elected. You know what I mean? It's it's there's an issue there. So I'm looking into um, but you know, I haven't developed this, but I think this is interesting, is into these ideas of sphere sovereignty, uh, which is, goes ways back to the Reformation. Uh, Althusius and uh, a, a contemporary one is called Dooyewerd. And, you know, they're thinking about the autonomy of different spheres and how they can collaborate. So, mm -hmm. you know, it gives you another frame to look at sure. uh, people state collaboration than the sovereign uh, ideology. And another concept that I'm uh, exploring is uh, magisterium of the commons. And so the basic idea here is that we have a magisteria for uh, politics, you know, who gets what through distribution, economics, who gets a surplus value, culture, you know, who gets um, to say what and, and create. 
and science, you know, legitimacy of the facts. And we have this set of interlocking institutions that do this, but we don't have institutions for, to protect the commons. So how can we imagine a new type of institutions, you know, at various scales, including planetary scales, that have power to protect mm. uh, human and extra human, mm. uh, you know, shared resources. And now we don't have the, like the partner state doesn't even have the regulations to even start thinking about those things, right? Apart from public commons regulations, which we have seen in Italy and different other countries. So that's really interesting that this is evolving as a, mm. you know, a theory of cooperation, but there's a lot more to do if you want yeah. a real partner state than that we are having today. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, the state as we've inherited is absolutistic. It's, it's, it has sort of absolute, you know, kind of jurisdiction yeah. over, um, you know, pretty much anything that you want to point a stick at. And, you know, as you know, from history, there, were, there was a point in time when the state and the church shared that. And there was ambiguity between who had, you know, jurisdiction, whose values, um, um, you know, and as and then and then you had a new economic sphere grow from within that, and then the state was empowered in a particular way um, in order to further particular interests. But over time, the state, you know, essentially uh, became um, sort of an absolute sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're talking about really fits for me epistemologically into a relational way of seeing the world mm. you know that we have multiple spheres of co-creation we have the commons is multi is is there's a multiplicity of the commons you know there's our atmospheric commons there's urban commons there's digital commons um and what we need is translators and intermediaries that are able to um in a sense, solve problems between these spheres. So instead of having this one absolute sphere where everything gets sorted out, um, you actually have a respect for a relational multiplicity of spheres of commoning. But but how do you have coordination between those? How do you um, have relationships and synergies? And how do you solve conflicts between them as well? Because conflicts are going to exist as well. And that that from a legal point of view is a different epistemology altogether. Yeah. Right. You know, positivist law is very simple. This is how it works, you know, and it's some futuristic legal uh, epistemology, which is able to embody that relational logic um, that's able to do that. Um, and really quickly, a term that I've been playing with is the idea of um, a pro the protocol commons. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that, um, you know, when Berners-Lee came up with H HTML, whatever, there was a way for different websites to talk to each other. There was a protocol that allowed these different entities to have a conversation. And so we actually need that for the spheres of the of commons, the multi multiplicity of commons. We need a language and a protocol within which all these different um, yeah. spheres of common can coordinate and solve problems together or conflicts between each other as well. Yeah, I think that's probably a great way to conclude uh, because I think we're about an hour uh, of conversation. Uh, Rock, do you have um, any other questions or? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so I think that was very comprehensive and it's only natural, I think, uh, with both of you um, kind of uh, having been dealing in this topic for, well, almost two decades now. Um, I just thought maybe, yeah, we could close off with a question we, we normally ask also our guests, which is uh, kind of uh, where can uh, our listeners and viewers um, kind of what would be the resources or different uh, kinds of networks that are active right now uh, that people could turn to to be actively involved in the Cosmolocal movement. So, uh, Jose, you mentioned the upcoming anthology. So it's upcoming, right? Uh, the Cosmo Local Reader. Yeah, that's right. So that's probably the main thing that I would, um, I would, I'd say, look out for the Cosmo Local Reader. We, you know, um, it's a collaboration between Michelle, myself, um, Sharon Ede, and 
Gian Wang. Uh, we have two dozen authors, um, 28, 28 examples or cases, not 38, 38 or so. I think it keeps on going down and up um, every couple of months. Um, and we have about a dozen essays as well that talk about different dimensions of it. It's going to be a very big document. Um, and it's going to have, you know, really great resources for, for understanding uh, what it is and, and the challenges and bringing it forward and, you know, and how you can get involved. So uh, that should be coming out in about, uh, I think I, the email said April or May. So, yeah. Great. Excellent. So with that, I think, yeah, we've come to a kind of organic conclusion. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jose, for joining us and, and discussing this paper with us. And we invite, yeah, of course, all the listeners, uh, viewers to yeah, read Jose's paper. I think it's a very good primer in uh, cosmolocalism, both historical and this kind of innovative, uh, I think, added value with this uh, analysis, preliminary analysis and the framework for analysis of, of these along with the various different challenges and needs of these communities that we've both highlighted here in the talk and I suppose a few extra ones uh, for those interested. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just super pleasure to talk to you both. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you, Jose. It was really interesting. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you both.